Today, our focus turns to what to expect from all-site vitrification. This webinar introduces attendees to the essentials of all-site vitrification, including theoretical principles and indications for all-site cryopreservation, optimization of the techniques, and the importance of the sample traceability. And today we are lucky to have presentations from Dr. Michelle DeVos and Dr. Peter Nash. So, as I mentioned already, we have uh, today two speakers, and the first one is going to be Dr. Michelle DeVos, who has worked as a gynecologist since 2006 and currently is a senior medical director at the Center for Reproductive Medicine at the University in Brussels, Belgium, and an associate professor in reproductive medicine in Brussels. He studied medicine in Ghent, Belgium, and holds a PhD in medicine from the University of Leeds, UK. In 2011, he was recognized as a subspecialist in reproductive medicine and surgery by ASHRAE and the European Board and College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Michelle has a keen interest in reproductive endocrinology, in vitro maturation of all sites, and fertility preservation. He is a principal investigator of the Freezing Ovarian Tissue and All Sites Consortium, encompassing on the fertility research projects at three universities in Brussels, and he is a founding member of the Belgian Fertility Education Initiative. So now it's over to you, Michel. Ladies and gentlemen, all site vitrification has been available for more than 10 years in many clinics worldwide. Today, I will share with you the available evidence as well as my personal views regarding the role of oocyte vitrification in the fertility clinic and in society. Here are some disclosures. So, why would women show an interest in oocyte vitrification? Well, the reproductive lifespan of a woman is limited. There is a decline of oocyte number and quality with advancing age and predicting whether a woman will ever become a mother when she is ready is looking into a crystal ball. Some women may be confronting an abnormal impact on their follicular pool such as surgery or chemotherapy and the rate of follicle decline when the impact has gone is difficult to predict too. Not only do we see a decline of the number of eggs, but also of their quality. This slide shows data from PGTA in a private clinic in Italy and depicts the euploidy rate per cohort of biopsied blastocysts from patients among ranges of maternal age at oocyte retrieval. Increasing rates of embryos with an abnormal chromosome configuration is the major driver of reduced fertility with increasing age and corresponds with the increasing number of oocytes needed in women of advancing age to have a live birth. This is the situation in ART but this correlates with the natural decline of fertility. What are the main indications for oocyte cryopreservation in the ART clinic? This is a picture of the global seed vault in Svalbard, Norway. I would like to use this picture as a metaphor for most, if not all, egg freezing indications. Typically, Women who have their eggs frozen to increase their options to have offspring in the future are hoping that they will never have to use these eggs. The seed vault in Svalbard is a place where seeds from all over the world are stored. The philosophy is very similar to egg freezing. We hope we will never have to use the seeds stored in that vault. Among indications for elective cryopreservation, we can identify egg donation and plant oocyte cryopreservation, formerly social freezing. 
non-elective cryopreservation includes oncofertility and medical freezing for non-oncological reasons. Let's start with planned oocyte cryopreservation. Why do women embark on this procedure? Marcia Inhorn and colleagues did a survey in 150 women in Israel and the US who had completed at least one cycle of egg freezing. According to their results, oocyte cryopreservation was not being used because of career planning, but rather for unplanned fertility preservation. Women who were in their late 30s and early 40s, women who did not plan at all to find themselves without a partner, who were facing the end of their reproductive lifespans. In most cases, these women request egg freezing because they would like to have a partner with whom to start a family and they want to buy time. Talking about buying time, does this strategy really offer value for money? Probably not, because the eggs are underutilized to be cost-efficient. Most women do not return to the clinic to use their eggs. However, there is emerging belief that cost efficiency in monetary terms should not be the goal of planned oocyte freezing. Peace of mind and a mental boost are more likely to be the primary goal of planned oocyte freezing. This psychological aspect of planned oocyte cryopreservation is gaining increased interest as a result of a number of sociological studies and surveys that have illustrated the impact and the role of planned oocyte cryopreservation for the quality of life of women in their 30s. The majority of women are satisfied after oocyte cryopreservation according to two published surveys performed by our team in Brussels. Would you recommend other people to have their oocytes cryopreserved? And 98% of women said yes. And to the question, would you consider undergoing the procedure again? 80% or even more said that they, want to, that, that they would do so. Nevertheless, decision regret is an important source of concern here. And this is why adequate counselling and correct information are important. We should have to discourage oocyte banking in women of advanced age, after the age of 38, 39, and in women with low ovarian reserve parameters, we have to explain clearly that they may have to invest into multiple rounds of oocyte stimulation to obtain a reasonable number of oocytes. And women also regretted that they had not done it at a younger age. So, for planned oocyte cryopreservation, adequate counselling is of crucial importance. According to the recommendations of the ESHRED Task Force on Ethics and Law in 2012, on social freezing, we should not raise false hopes. We should not present this option as a warrant for successful future reproduction. It is not an insurance. We should give information about the small percentage of women actually using these oocytes. And we should evaluate every candidate based on age and ovarian reserve parameters. Long-term pill users should have to take a pill holiday for at least two months to be able to correctly assess ovarian reserve parameters. We should discuss the nature, the risks and the limitations of the procedure and we should also discuss alternatives, for instance use of donor oocytes in the future. We should also discuss the time frame within which these oocytes can be used, the costs of the procedure, the storage, the use and the fate of the leftover oocytes. Also, we have to acknowledge that survival rates of oocytes can differ 
from center to center. Is oocyte cryopreservation safe? Now this is a study from Elena Labata from Valencia, Spain, showing that the percentage of aneuploid embryos is not different after stimulation compared to the natural cycle. So this is very important and reassuring for our patients who undergo ovarian stimulation to freeze their eggs. We should explain that information on the long-term safety for the children cannot be provided since the number of children born after the use of cryopreserved oocytes is still limited and follow-up data are still being collected. Nevertheless, epigenetic safety data are reassuring. This is a study from our center in Brussels showing that global methylation levels were similar between embryos derived from fresh and from vitrified oocytes. And also the obstetric and neonatal outcomes appear promising and comparable to pregnancies obtained with fresh oocytes. The more oocytes the better has been a controversial statement in standard ART treatment. When you look at live birth rates after one single stimulation cycle within specific ovarian response categories. The figure on this slide, however, is not derived from one single cycle, but from multiple rounds of ovarian stimulation in women of varying ages. And according to the available data, and most of these data are from the EV network in Spain, in young women we see that cumulative egg numbers are associated with increasing chances of live birth. But this is not the case in women of advanced age. And these data are in line with studies of ploidy of embryos, where the probability of having a euploid embryo derived from one cycle is also highly depending on age. And more eggs at an older age does not result in proportionally more euploid embryos. In high responders, we should no longer be afraid of severe ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. It's simply a complication of the past, as long as you stimulate the ovaries with a GnRH antagonist protocol, and if you use a GnRH agonist trigger, trigger for final oocyte maturation. And obviously you cryopreserve the oocytes. However, ovarian stimulation in predicted high responders should be approached with caution. This patient of 34 years old underwent planned oocyte cryopreservation. She had very high AMH levels, a normal BMI, and she was stimulated with 100 and, 150 units of recombinant FSH daily, which resulted in excessive response with 25 mature oocytes being cryopreserved. The patient suffered significant discomfort due, due to enlarged volume of the ovaries and due to subtorsion of the ovaries. In this type of patients, severe ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome will be very unlikely, but the incidence of mild and moderate ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome could be as high as 38% according to a study by Schrem et al. in Canada. What do we know about the utilization rates of oocytes after planned oocyte cryopreservation? Several surveys have been published that looked at reproductive status and intentions in women who had planned oocyte cryopreservation. And according to all of these surveys, Return rates are low, and this is of course an important reason for the low cost efficiency of plant oocyte cryopreservation. But as I already mentioned, this probably does not really matter. What do we actually know of the reproductive outcomes of women who did plant oocyte cryopreservation? And these are data 
from our survey in Brussels and a survey from a group in the Netherlands. Nearly 50% had tried to conceive after they had undergone plant oocyte cryopreservation. And of those who conceived, or sorry, of those who had tried to conceive, nearly 70% had achieved a pregnancy. Of those who conceived, 30% did so with cryopreserved oocytes, and almost 50% in our study had a natural conception. And in the Dutch study, even 76% of past oocyte bankers had a natural conception after oocyte freezing. So it may well be that plant egg freezing enhances the potential of women to have stable relationships that may result in a natural pregnancy. A major indication for non-elective cryopreservation is women who have a diagnosis of cancer and who have to start chemotherapy that may be toxic for their follicles and oocytes. For ovarian stimulation, we need more or less two to three weeks. If this is not possible, ovarian tissue cryopreservation can be offered or collection of immature oocytes for in vitro maturation. Random start protocols for ovarian stimulation are standard practice these days. We can start ovarian stimulation at any stage of the menstrual cycle. And letrozole can be added in women with breast cancer who have steroid receptor positive disease. GnRH antagonists can be replaced by progestins to suppress the LH peak and to reduce the number of injections and to reduce cost. With also similar outcomes compared to GnRH antagonists, at least in egg donation cycles, but there should be no reason why this could not apply to oncofertility. And according to recent data, success rates of IVF with frozen eggs in cancer survivors are lower than those of women who had planned oocyte cryopreservation. What are the clinical outcomes when using vitrified oocytes for, cryo for fertility preservation across different indications? Well, we see, according to these studies, that survival rates mostly lie above 80%. Live birth rates range from around 20% to above 40% depending on the indication. There has also been an interest in egg freezing in individuals with Turner syndrome. These individuals have a very low fertility rate because of premature ovarian failure. And in adolescents who show an interest in egg freezing when they have Turner syndrome, it may be useful to frequently monitor anti-mullerian hormone levels and to offer egg freezing when AMH starts to decline. Obviously, this procedure requires psychosocially mature postmenarche adolescents to tolerate ovarian stimulation and egg retrieval. And also, higher rates of chromosomal abnormalities are observed in the conceptions of women with Turner syndrome and therefore PGTA has been recommended and miscarriage rates are twice as high as in the normal population. So what would you need to take home from this presentation? Well first of all oocyte cryopreservation is not an insurance policy. It is merely a tool to increase the chances of having a biological, biological child. And in view of this, counselling is hugely important. Clear and detailed information to avoid decision regret, as well, as, as well in acute situations such as oncofertility, as in plant oocyte cryopreservation. It may be useful for fertility preservation clinics to recruit paramedic staff to enhance the quality of counselling. 
these staff are referred to as patient navigators. The number of oocytes may be correlated with total live birth rates, especially in young women. And predicted poor anti-responders require specific attention. Poor responders because they may need multiple rounds of egg freezing and high responders because they have an increased risk of side effects and complications. Thank you for watching and listening. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, this was a very instructive talk. And now we are moving to our second speaker, Dr. Peter Nash. Peter Nash is the scientific and laboratory director at Reproductive Biologi Biological Associates in Atlanta, USA. He obtained his MD in 1986 and his obstetrics and gynecology specialty degrees in 1996 at the Medical University in Budapest. He obtained his PhD at the Pre-University of Brussels in 1997 on development of ICSI procedure. Dr. Nash has acquired a distinct knowledge and experience on embryo science, including novel viability assessment methods. He has also investigated the basic and clinical aspects of cryopreservation and developed with his team a highly efficient proper protocol in 2006 for all-site vitrification that has contributed to the development of the largest donor all-site cryobank in North America. Dr. Nash is a member of several national and international professional societies, including the SRM, ASHRAE, and ALPHA. He is also board member of the International Society for Fertility Preservation of the Alliance for, for Fertility Preservation and past chairman of Alpha Scientist in Reproductive Medicine. Dr. Nash is a reviewer of several medical journals and currently he is a section editor of RBM Online. He is an author and co-author of over 200 publications and several book chapters and five books. So now it's over to you, Peter. Good afternoon or good morning or good evening, depending on uh, which place of the world you are. My name is Peter Nagy. I'm an embryologist working at the Reproductive Biology Associates. In this presentation, I would like to tell you about uh, what to expect from all site vitrification. And that's an update both from the clinical and the laboratory side. I have the following disclosures. I have uh, stocks in Prelude and Inception Network. I've been on the scientific advisory board of Cooper Surgical. I was paid consultant of EMD Serono and part of Speakers Bureau of Merck MSD. If we look at the number of cryopreservation cycles performed in the United States, at least for those years where we have available data through SART, we can see that between 2007 and 2016, there were a 33 times increase in these 10 years of period, and that includes also the uh, embryo cryopreservation and the oocyte cryopreservation cycles. If we look at the main reason why there is such an exponential increase in cryopreservation cycles, I think it's very clear uh, why we were using the slow freezing cryopreservation for both oocyte and embryo. It was working uh, quite well for embryos, but not so much for oocytes. It was really the technological breakthrough uh, that brought vitrification into the daily practice, and especially Dr. Kubayama in Japan uh, has to be acknowledged about it, but also here at RB and uh, in the United States and also at IVI, um, Dr. Kobo uh, played an important role about this. So what is vitrification? Basically, to say in simple words, is a uh, glass transition of uh, fluid uh, into a solid state without crystallization, and that's really the key word, that there is no crystallization. So as this uh, figure demonstrates, the higher the cooling and warming rates and higher the viscosity and lower the volume of the sample, the higher the probability that there will be no uh, crystallization, that the liquid phase is going through the glass phase without uh, crossing, crossing the ice nucleation temperature. This slide shows uh, the efficiency what vitrification brought us in terms of uh, number of eggs needed, 
uh, to have one baby back at the time when using slow uh, cooling needed about 100 150 eggs to have one baby uh, today you need about five or six eggs uh, to have one baby obviously those eggs has to be the highest quality typically coming from uh, young healthy donors operator experience is extremely important contributing factor for successful vitrification nobody can deny that one who has enough experience can possibly uh, achieve better outcomes than those uh, who has just recently started. As mentioned earlier, one of the key elements of successful vitrification is the ultra-rapid cooling part um, that needs to be around 20,000 Celsius per minute and similarly also the warming has to be uh, similarly fast. There are two main groups of cryoprotective agents permeating and non-permeating and as the word indicates the permeating uh, agents they are able to get through the plasma membrane like propanediol, DMSO, glycerol, or ethylene glycol and they are protecting against the uh, ice crystallization from within the cell. Then the non-permeating ones that are for instance glucose, sucrose, fico that are not able to get through the plasma membrane um, but uh, they are able to draw out water from inside of the cell in this way uh, decreasing the chance uh, for crystallization. And then um, recently there are some other components, supplements that has been used uh, in a vitrification medium that includes hydroxic propyl cellulose, trehalose, and also some uh, other kind of supplements. The effect of the volume, um, as previously stated, the smaller the volume, the higher the probability of the uh, successful vitrification. Here on the left side uh, you can see the different drop sizes that is around uh, the cell or the oocyte and obviously the very left one is just way too much um, medium that is left. The very right one is probably a little bit too much uh, cryo solution that was removed so the ideal is somewhere in the middle that um, as little as possible but there is still sufficient to, to cover the cell. There are different cryo carriers available, those that uh, provide direct contact and minimum volume approach are the best. Um, one of the best examples is, for instance, the cryotop that you can see on the very right side of this slide that provides cooling and warming rates above 20,000 Celsius per minute. All site vitrification uh, protocols are very similar these days. Typically, it is performed at room temperature and it also involves uh, putting the oocytes through a series of different cryo solutions, starting with the wash solution and then the drop next to it, uh, that is, um, equilibration solution is merged together, and then in another two minutes, the next equilibration solution is also merged, keeping another two minutes there, the oocyte, and then after transferring the oocytes into a dish that also contains no undiluted uh, equilibration solution for up to 10 minutes and then the oocyte is passed into the vitrification solution where it's kept about 30 to 40 seconds before it's put on the cryo carrier. When we do the oocyte <coughs> warming um, we basically uh, turn around the situation and we uh, remove it from the liquid nitrogen and put it into a uh, um, tow solution um, that is actually at 37 Celsius and uh, we uh, warm up the eggs extremely rapidly and uh, we keep it for approximately one minute uh, into that towing solution and then uh, depending what is you know your protocol you can pass uh, through uh, two steps of dilution solutions and then one or two steps of uh, washing solutions. Um, sometimes it can involve even more uh, steps and more uh, drops uh, to passing through. The whole principle is to try to reduce uh, the osmotic shock uh, for the oocytes when passing through of uh, these different concentrations of, of drops. And um, during the years or decades, uh, there have been uh, many 
uh, different uh, cryocarriers that were used or attempted to be used for oocyte or for embryo vitrification. Today's cryocarriers, uh, they are all look uh, very similar and provide uh, the same conditions for cryopreservation of the oocyte. So what <clears throat> results can we expect after egg vitrification? Study from Italy published a couple of years ago uh, shows outcomes comparing use of fresh oocytes, oocytes that were slow frozen and oocytes that were vitrified. Back at that time, Italy had a restrictive law that only three eggs could be inseminated and all the others they had to be cryopreserved. And this way they have accumulated a large amount of data. What you see here and the most important part is circled in red uh, at the bottom of the slide. So uh, it shows that when you use fresh eggs, you need about 35 eggs to have one baby. When you use uh, slow frozen eggs, you need about 61. And when you use vitrified eggs, you need about uh, 47. So vitrification is definitely much more efficient than slow freezing. To compare fresh and vitrified oocyte outcomes is probably the best when you are able to use uh, sibling oocytes. And for instance, in this study that is coming from our clinic, uh, Reproductive Biology Associates, um, there were patients uh, who had larger number of eggs, but they did not want to inseminate all of those eggs. Um, so above a certain number, we vitrified those eggs. And then if patients later, they came back, uh, we used those vitrified eggs. So we were able to compare with their fresh outcomes. Uh, you can see here fresh cycle with a green background, the warming, uh, vitrified warming cycles with a pink background. Uh, on average, it was about an 83% survival of the vitrified warmed oocytes. Uh, but then when you look at the other outcomes after ICSI, we had about 71% fertilization rate of fresh, fresh oocytes, 78% of the vitrified uh, warm oocytes. Blastocyst development was comparable 43% versus 49%, and also pregnancy outcomes were very comparable. So this the study demonstrates that uh, fresh and vitrified oocytes from simply eggs, they are very similar in terms of outcomes. Another study from um, Dr. Vega and colleagues uh, shows outcomes comparing fresh donor oocytes with vitrified donor oocytes. And as you can see, fertilization rate was very similar, 80% in the fresh oocytes, 78% in the vitrified oocytes. Uh, good quality embryo, 54% in fresh and 49% in the vitrified oocytes. So once again, different study, um, but the outcomes are very similar, fresh versus vitrified X. One of the questions that is frequently asked, so what happens with vitrified eggs if you have to ship them? We know that they are working well um, if you are using them where they were uh, cryopreserved, but what happens after shipping? And this uh, study that we performed here at Reptile Biology Associates is addressing these questions. We have a large number of uh, vitrified donor eggs in-house, but we also receive some vitrified donor eggs from outside clinics, and we compare the outcomes. when you look at those outcomes in uh, terms of uh, survival rate, uh, fertilization rate, embryo development, implantation, and clinical pregnancy rate are nearly identical. So this shows very clearly that when you shipping uh, vitrified eggs in an appropriate way, then the outcomes are not affected. Many times comes up the question that what about um, egg yield versus egg quality. Um, when we look at, for instance, donor cycles and donors that are producing a large number of eggs, sometimes some donors they get you know 30, 40, or 50, or even more eggs, um, <clears throat> and we look at how their outcomes uh, compare. If we look at the first column where uh, we put donors who had less than 20 eggs, second column. Uh, donors 20 to 39x, and third column were more than 40x. Uh, again, if we just focus on the most important outcome parameters, survival rate, it was 91% for donors less than 20x, 92% for donors between 20 and 40x, and for donors more than 40x, it was about 88% survival. Fertilization was very similar, although in the donors more than 40x it was slightly lower 
And um, if we look at clinical pregnancy rate or implantation rate, there we don't see any difference, uh, statistically speaking. So the big question really is um, when you talk to a patient um, who wants to do fertility preservation, for instance, how many eggs to cryopreserve? And you know this is this is a question that's very very hard to answer because uh, we cannot really predict uh, baby outcomes. So if we look at some of the uh, publication that shows um, the number of eggs used to have live births. Uh, and that comes from IBI, uh, from Anna Kobo. It shows that uh, from donor eggs, uh, they needed approximately 15 eggs to get one live birth. And then uh, using autologous oocytes, depending on the patient age, for instance, those patients who are 40 years or older uh, needed approximately 55 eggs. So there is a very clear correlation that... Uh, shows that the higher the reproductive age, the more oocytes you know. When we look at our own data from Reproductive Biology Associates, how the patient age is correlated uh, with outcomes, you can see it from, from this table. Uh, we divided patients into two groups. One is the 30 to 36 years old, other is the 37 to 39 on the right-hand side. Um, basically, uh, it was done that in the younger age group you needed approximately 12 eggs uh, to get one live birth and in the more advanced age group you needed about 30 eggs to get one live birth otherwise the outcomes uh, in terms of fertilization survival rate are uh, somewhat comparable so age as you saw it before is an important predictor of what is the likelihood to have a baby on the other hand it is not very precise and it cannot really predict individual patients. So what else can we do? How can we assess better egg quality? We have different options. There are invasive and non-invasive approaches. The best known uh, invasive test is the polar bi the biopsy that has been around for quite some time. Polar body biopsy shows some correlation with predicting the viability of the oocyte. Unfortunately, it is uh, not a very good predictor of the derived uh, embryo viability. And definitely, when it's compared to trophectoderm biopsy, um, the predictive value is much lower. So what about the non-invasive approaches? There are a number of different options, including, of course, the uh, traditional morphological evaluation uh, using the light microscope. Um, and then including um, metabolomics and other uh, different options that I'm not going to go into details. Using the most traditional approach, light microscopic observation of oocyte morphology, we all know that uh, there are uh, certain oocyte malformation that definitely uh, will uh, predict a very poor outcome, uh, whether we uh, vitrify the oocytes or use it fresh um, probably doesn't make a big difference. Uh, on the other hand, morphological evaluation in itself is not very much predictive, especially if these alterations are not very significant. There have been a number of studies that looked at uh, metabolic uh, composition of the culture medium, especially uh, from embryos. In this specific study uh, from our group, we looked at the uh, metabolomic uh, composition of the medium where the oocytes spent a couple of hours uh, before we used it, and we saw correlation between uh, morphological grading and also uh, embryo development capacity, and even further, uh, even with the implantation potential of the derived uh, embryos. Another non-invasive option to try to estimate uh, oocyte quality is to look at not the oocyte itself, but the cumulus and corona complex around it. We all very well know that um, during the follicular growth, um, the oocyte is completely depending on the surrounding cells. And what is the quality of the surrounding cells uh, could be very well indicating what is the quality of the oocyte. There have been a number of studies um, that uh, looked at uh, different uh, genes, gene expressions uh, from the cumulus and corona cells. Here in this slide, you can see three different studies. 
and the different genes that they looked at the expression. And uh, all of these studies, they actually uh, demonstrated that there was a very good positive predictive value and accuracy uh, among those uh, genes that were uh, looked at for the expression. Here in this slide, you can see that using those uh, gene expression studies, uh, combining it with uh, embryo morphological uh, data at the time of selecting the embryos for transfer, uh, it was possible to have uh, a higher uh, clinical and live birth rate than, than using only the morphological selection of the embryos alone. Another upcoming and you know, future possibility is to use so-called artificial intelligence. Um, there are companies um, that are developing uh, software that should be able to predict uh, embryo viability and uh, some extent also site viability. And of course, this still has to be proven uh, that those algorithms, they are uh, selecting and predicting uh, embryos and all sites better than we can do it with our uh, traditional evaluation methods. And then just let's take a brief look um, if there are some options that we can further improve all site cryopreservation outcomes. When we look at outcome data from SART, uh, this is the um, organization that collects um, you know, uh, results from all IVF clinics here in the United States. And this is specifically outcomes from frozen donor eggs. You can see that live birth rates um, can vary from one clinic to the other. The average live birth rates in the uh, United States is about 38%. But then you have clinics where they reach 48, 49%, 46% live birth rate. And then there are other clinics where they have you know significantly lower like 32 35 percent and of course there are a number of different reasons that uh, can play into this outcomes but definitely operator training and experience is one of the most important one automating vitrification uh, that has been suggested um, one uh, of the promise of this that it would provide you know consistent timing volume temperature no variation, you know, from uh, one operator to the others, with other words, standardization, standardizing the process. Uh, does it translate into improved outcomes? We still have to see. We know that when it comes to embryo vitrification, outcomes are probably uh, comparable to one that is uh, done by an embryologist. Uh, for all site vitrification, we still have to see whether this system is able to provide the same or even uh, better outcomes, but it is definitely an option. And to conclude, um, we can say that all site cryopreservation using vitrification became a daily routine procedure, which provides excellent outcomes for fertility preservation and also for other indications. Um, there are promising technologies that may be able to assess quality viability of all sites. Uh, however, it has not been routinely used yet. Variation in egg cryopreservation outcomes still exist, stressing that operator training experience remain an essential factor of achieving the best possible outcomes with all site vitrification. Still have a couple of more slides that is listing the references uh, that was used for uh, this presentation. Second page, third page, and the last page. Thank you for your attention. So thank you, Boris, for these excellent and insightful lectures. And now it's time to open uh, our Q&A session. And first of all, I want to thank you all the participants who already submitted their questions. And I think we will start uh, with the first question. Uh, and I'm going to address this question to both of you, Peter and Michelle, regarding the uh, immature eggs. All all of us, we know that during the stimulation uh, protocol, we get not only mature, but immature eggs as well on different stages, GV, M1. So what about your tactics uh, in this case? So Peter, maybe you will answer first. Sure, absolutely. So, um, you know, when we get immature eggs, which we get probably for every patient, um, somewhere between, you know, 10 to 20 percent, um, and we want to freeze them uh, to have an additional backup for the patient. We typically wait until that those eggs mature up uh, in vitro. And once they mature up, 
uh, arrive to the meta phase two stage, then we are going to vitrify those eggs. If they don't mature up, we typically don't uh, going to vitrify them. Okay, thank you, Michel. Do you want to add something? Well, in, in typical situations for plants, oocyte quiet preservation, we discard immature eggs. We only vitrify um, eggs that have um, shown the metaphase two stage. Although in specific circumstances, such as cancer patients who only have this single unique possibility to quiet preserve some eggs, we would um, we would believe that it could be an option to um, mature the immature um, oocytes in vitro. Um, the problem there is that um, to ascertain that they are immature, you have to denude the oocytes. And we know that um, denuded oocytes lack the support from the cumulus. And um, by doing so, the potential of these oocytes is rather poor. But for cancer patients, it could be an option. If I may just add something very quickly, uh, sometimes comes up the question, what is a better strategy um, when you get the immature eggs, whether would you vitrify those as immature eggs and then when you want to use them later, warm it up and then try to mature them, or you get the immature eggs uh, from the patient, you try to mature them up in vitro, and once they mature up, then you freeze them and then use them later when it's possible. Our own experience uh, here at RBA, we looked at, uh, you know, these two strategies is, is a better outcome when you try to mature up in vitro the X, the immature X, before vitrification and then to vitrify it. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, because I think uh, we can see here that uh, uh, it's an overview of different uh, st strategies that clinic can use, and it's up to them to decide which one they're going to choose in this case. Okay, so coming to the next one, we've got a lot of questions regarding timing during the vitrification procedure. And I think uh, we will start uh, from uh, Michelle, and the first question will be to you regarding the time, the proper time between the, the injection of HCG and the time of pickup procedure. That's a good question, although I have to correct the question because we usually do not administer HCG for final of uh, maturation, but a GnRH agonist. We know that we could also administer Kispeptin, uh, but that's not very popular because of its cost. But after GnRH agonist triggering, um, we, we typically perform the egg retrieval 36 hours later. Um, I know there have been some published studies looking into this and comparing 36 hours with um, more delayed egg retrieval, up to 40 or even more. We see that the maturation rates will go up if you wait a bit longer, but um, the embryo quality may suffer, and so this is not really recommended. So let's stick to the 36 hours as far as that interval is concerned. Okay, thank you, Peter. Do you have uh, any other time limits for the pickup procedure? We, we also typically do uh, egg retrieval 36 hours after the trigger shot and uh, do the uh, decumulation about two hours later. Um, and then we start to do the vitrification of the oocytes about 39 hours after the trigger shot. So we try to do vitrification of the actual X between 39 and 40 hours in that time range after the trigger. Okay, one more question regarding denudation procedure, because for ICSI, for example, uh, many publications uh, and many authors don't recommend to denude totally, yeah, to remove all cumulus cells. Then we talk about the oocyte vitrification. How important is it to remove all cumulus cells? Right. So, again, um, if we remove all the cumulus cells, I think you probably have a better chance for a successful vitrification. I don't think it has been uh, studied uh, many different ways, uh, you know, to do this. Um, I have also experienced that we can vitrify oocytes with some cumulus and corona cells around it, and it still can be successful. Uh, back at the time when ICSI started in, in Brussels, uh, you know, we also so thinking, we were thinking about to leave some 
corona sales around the OSI, we didn't see very big difference in terms of outcomes or any any benefit. So I can I cannot really confirm that this is doing anything better for the X. Okay, great. And another question again to you, Peter, uh, about the time uh, after thawing. So then we th thaw our all sites. Uh, uh, we should do ICSI. What about the time limit in this case? Right. So when we warm the uh, vitrified eggs, we typically uh, let them uh, in a culture dish for about two and a half, three hours, and then uh, we start to do the ICSI procedure. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. So now let's discuss a little bit uh, the protocols that uh, you use. Yeah, and I'm going to address this question to you, Peter, again, because uh, as we all know, uh, companies uh, provide a really very clear IFU, and they recommend to stick to this IFU regarding volumes, times, and so on. As we can see in clinics, people use different volumes, times, and so on. So can you comment on this? First of all, what is really very important regarding volumes during vitrification? Let's start with this point. Okay, I, I think everything is important. Yeah. Um, and uh, when we look at the different uh, protocols from the different companies, the different kits, uh, actually today they are very, very similar to each other. Um, I think, in, in my opinion, uh, a little bit of the limiting factor is, is the actual volume of the, each uh, kit that they are containing. You know, back at the time, you know, when here at RBA we started to do vitrification and there were not yet kits available on the market, uh, you know, we were preparing our own uh, vitrification solutions. My colleague, uh, Dr. Cheng, was doing that. And because of that, we were able to use um, you know, much larger volumes for vitrification and also for warming. And, you know, we saw some benefits of using larger volumes for both for vitrification and for, for warming. They are, again, regarding the, the actual steps, uh, you know, using the kits that are available on the market, I think they are all working well. Um, you know, we have tried, I think, most, most of them or nearly all of them. And I can tell you that they are, they are working well. Um, you know, importantly, you can just try to uh, put the eggs, you know, in a series of different drops to make sure that the osmotic shock on the egg um, is not very strong. You know, eggs are more sensitive definitely than the embryos. Another uh, possible, um, possible strategy is that because if you have to work with smaller volumes of these cryo solutions, then you can put an uh, oil overlay, but that, of course, has other um, you know, challenges when you are manipulating, you know, the X and going from one drop to the other. You mean draw, draw, during warming procedure, yeah? So we can perform, as, as we could see from your presentation as well, that you perform this stage under oil. No, no, that was not under oil. That's, that's without oil. But, uh, okay. you know, it, it is possible to, to use, you know, oil, oil cover too. Okay, yeah, great. Yeah, thank you. So let's now discuss the number of eggs that we can put on one carrier. And I want to address the first question to Michelle. Uh, from the clinical point of view, as a doctor, uh, what number of all sites will you recommend to the patient to have Then you feel comfortable, yeah? Then you feel safe for her to have well, we, we know there is um, a famous saying that you should not put all your eggs in one basket. So this means that if a patient has, um, for instance, 20 vitrified oocytes, and she vitrified these oocytes when she was uh, 35 years old, then I would not recommend to um, warm all these oocytes at, at, at the same time. So I would do it in um, two rounds of uh, 10 oocytes each. Although this is obviously a discussion that you need to have with the individual patients. Some patients would be even more cautious and would um, ask for warming of batches of five eggs um, every time. The thing is, the more um, you split up 
your complete number of eggs into different small numbers, um, the more ICSI procedures you need. So this is going to increase the cost, but it's probably going to reduce um, the risk because after warming, um, if you create embryos, then obviously if you have more en embryos than you need, you will need to vitrify these embryos. So women may be um, inclined to be more cautious um, but I, I would say that for, for women of around the age of 35, which is the most common age at which someone would have her um, oocytes frozen, that would be about, about 10 eggs to, um, to warm. Okay, thank you. And now the question, the same question to you, Peter. So now knowing the answer from the clinician point of view, clinician side, from the embryology point of view, how many eggs will you recommend to have on one carrier? Right. Um, you know, I think we can um, put several eggs on, on one carrier. Uh, you know, technically, it is possible to put four, five, or even six, depending also on the type of the carrier that you are using. Uh, I don't that necessarily recommend to put that many, <laughs> but this is, this is an option if a patient has a very large number of eggs. Um, you know, Usually, when we we vitrify eggs, we typically put you know two, three, or four, uh, depending on the total amount of eggs that a patient has. When we use you know uh, donors and donor vitrifications, then typically we put two eggs per carrier at maximum. Okay, and uh, I want to ask both of you the last question, and we need a quick answer. So, can you tell us one was the most uh, one reason or that can affect the the oocyte vitrification maybe from clinician clinical and the embryology point of view something really very important that can affect the result of the procedure can i answer um, chemotherapy before vitrification don't do it so a patient um, who has already had chemotherapy um, recently, she should she should not have her oocytes vitrified. Okay, thank you, Peter. Yes, I, I fully agree that uh, first of all, patient uh, is very much uh, determining. You know how is the egg quality, and that we see that not only when we vitrify the oocytes, but also when we use it fresh. Um, how important is you know the the patient uh, herself, and additionally to that, when we vit to vitrification of the oocytes, then the handling of the oocytes is extremely critical. You know, uh, we see very clearly that there are differences, you know, from one vitrifier to the other vitrifier, and that's really just because of the handling, how people they are doing the vitrification cooling part and, and the warming part. Okay, thank you very much. Sadly, but we have reached the end of the sessions, and uh, I want to thank you to all panel and to those of you attending this webinar uh, and for the very interesting questions that you raised. So the full recording of this webinar will be available on demand. So please encourage others to sign up if uh, you liked what you heard today. We will also send you an email with you a certificate of attendance and a link to an evaluation survey. And we really value your feedback and encourage you to use this opportunity to let us know what you think of our series. So thank you for attending and we hope to see you to our journal club in a week on Tuesday, May 4th. The paper presented is live birth and parental outcomes using cryopreserved all sites. Registrations are opened on the website. In the meantime, Keep safe and stay healthy.